Good morning. This My name is Patrick Malcolm. I'm a senior partner at GFM Wealth Advisory. Welcome to everyone joining us today. I'm very fortunate to have both Jack Colliby and Alex Patton from Perpetual uh, talking about the Pure Microcap Fund. Before I introduce uh, Jack and Alex, um, I just wanted to talk about this fund very briefly and why we like microcap investing. So um, as many would know, um, our top 100 index in Australia is very dominated by banks and resource stocks, the big four and the big mining companies. Uh, investing in the microcap space gives exposure to a very large and diverse index that you don't get in the large cap space. It does provide the opportunity for excess returns as we see through the performance of this fund due to poor coverage. Often companies outside the top 100 aren't as well covered as investments inside the top 100. It does provide access to early stage companies that are growing their earnings strongly. Microcaps can have uh, more focused uh, management and board. And finally, it can be um, a hunting ground for um, takeovers and larger corporates as well. Now, before I introduce Alex and Jack, um, I do need to show um, everyone our very exciting um, disclaimer. Uh, and there it is. Now, um, certainly you can read that at your leisure. But the most important thing to note about today is uh, all the discussion items and advice today is general in nature. If you want advice that's specific to your situation, please call our office and speak to your advisor. Um, we also have a second disclaimer from Perpetual there as well. So um, I'll introduce uh, Jack and Alex. Jack and Alex, thanks for joining us today. Uh, good morning, Patrick. Thanks for uh, having us. And good morning, everyone, GFN clients. Thanks, Jack. Patrick. How are you, Alex? Um, yeah, I'm well, thank you. Yeah, nice to see you again. And uh, thanks for the opportunity. No worries, thank you. Now, um, before we start to talk about the fund, guys, just a little bit about your background. Um, Jack, I noticed since we la had our webinar last year, you've notched up 20 years at Perpetual. And as the saying yeah, goes, you don't, you don't get long for murder these days, Jack. So um, can you tell us a little bit about your background at Perpetual and why you love working there? Yeah, so yeah, I've been at Perpetual since my into my 21st year, which, which seems un unbelievable. But, um, you know, I started on the dealing desk, you know, as a young bloke and um, spent five years there and then five years as an analyst uh, here, working mainly on small caps. Uh, and then I've run the small cap fund for 12 years and I started the micro cap fund about eight or nine years ago. I think it's coming up to sort of eight or nine years. Um, so I'm very much, you know, a perpetual value investor through and through. Um, but I'm fortunate enough to be given, you know, opportunities internally and, and learn from some good people, uh, especially in my early formative years. Um, so, yeah, no, it's, uh, it's been good, a good place to sort of learn and continue to learn uh, my craft. Good stuff, Jack. Now, Alex, your background, obviously you haven't been there quite as long as Jack, but can, can you tell us about your background and how long you've been at Perpetual for? Yeah, I've just uh, ticked over earlier this year, 10 years years at Perpetual um, and I started uh, in in the accounting function here and, and did my CA qualification then had the opportunity to move into the equities team uh, about seven years ago. I've been working uh, pretty closely with Jack uh, since then, helping him, uh, you know, look for, for micro cap opportunities and, and small cap opportunities for the funds. And uh, so Perpetual is kind of really all I've known um, from a professional investing standpoint. And, uh, you know, it's great being part of um, such a big, big team of experienced investors and, and a business that's obviously, um, you know, been uh, following a pretty, uh, you know, strict process for, for, for a long period of time. Surely it would have been more fun to stay in the internal accounting division of Perpetual than moving into funds management, Alex. Yeah, look, I can't say it was a tough decision. <laughs> now, um, before I ask you a question about um, the investment objective and philosophy of the fund, Jack, I just wanted to touch very, very briefly on the performance of the fund. And I know you guys are very modest, um, but as you mentioned before, the fund's been running since um, August 2013. And it's produced a return of 16% per annum. And to give people a reference point, the um, Emerging Companies Index has only made 8% per annum over that time. And the Small Ordinaries Index has made 5% per annum over that time. And one of my little bug bugbears is um, our incessant focus on annualised uh, returns. And I understand why we focused on annualised returns because it allows a comparison. But when we look at the cumulative returns of the Perpetual Pure Microcap micro Fund, it's made 340% 
cumulative since inception. If you'd invested in the Emerging Companies Index, you would have only made 116%. Small caps have only made 66 And interestingly, um, the ASX 100's only made 90% over that time. The most important thing in those numbers is that the fund has done that with 15% less volatility than the Emerging Companies Index. Um, just to give people, our audience, a sense of how the fund has performed in recent uh, financial years, the fund had an unbelievable year last year. It produced a return of uh, 1%, which doesn't sound amazing, but when we consider what other markets have done, that's extraordinary. That's after making 49% in the previous financial year. And I'm not going to exclude the COVID year. In the COVID year, the fund only lost 2%. So it's had an unbelievable three years, Jack. So I'll pump your tyres up there. Um, can you talk about, can you can you tell the audience about the investment objective and the philosophy of the fund? Yeah, no problems, Patrick. Um, yeah, look, I think it's probably the most important thing to sort of think about what people think about when they think microcaps and how our fund is is different. Um, at Perpetual, and, it, you know, this is across all the funds, we only invest in profitable companies, um, and all these companies have to pass four quality filters. Uh, these quality filters relate to having strong management, a good balance sheet, recurring earnings of profitability, and a quality business. So when we think microcaps, you know, how is our fund different from other microcap funds is probably the most important differentiating thing. It's not what we own so much, it's what we don't own. We don't own unprofitable companies. We don't own speculative companies. We don't own biotechs. We don't own concept stocks. We don't own highly leveraged companies with a lot of debt. And it's really, sometimes it's those, what we don't own, that gives us that performance. And those quality filters and that process is really all based on capital preservation. We always say rule number one of making money, don't lose money. And if you've got a profitable company with next to no debt or very low levels of debt with good management that's um, you know, a good business, we understand a business that will be around for a long time, you know, the likelihood of losing a lot of money, you know, is, is greatly diminished. So that's really at the core of what we do. Um, we're very strict on those discipline, on that rule in terms of, you know, we don't waver when the markets were, you know, a lot of speculative technology companies and growth companies, um, valuations are going through the roof. Um, you know, we didn't chase that market, which was hard at the time. You know, it can be times when, you know, it's difficult, but we're very true to that process and very adherent uh, um, in terms of making sure uh, all our companies are safe and solid bets uh, rather than taking excessive risk. Understood, Jack. And sort of linking in with that, I guess if you sort of explain the concept of the fund to most people that it's investing comp investing in smaller companies, and I understand there's different definitions of microcap, whether it's size or outside the, the 300, but I guess at a very high level, if you said that you're investing in yep. those sorts of companies, people would they would think they were speculative in nature. Um, is that, I know it's not what the fund's about, but is that what the index is like and how is the perpetual universe different from the index overall? Yeah, that's right. I mean, our companies, they are small by the definition of the word, you know, micro cap. We define micro cap as a free float of $300 million dollars or less, um, but just because they're small doesn't mean they're not good businesses. They're just not very large businesses. And as you mentioned, Patrick, down this end of the market, there's not a lot of broker research on these companies. And because we've got a large team of you know professional analysts, we can scour the market and look for these opportunities. We do our own work analysis, meet with all these companies ourselves. Um, and we can find these companies that are, you know, under the radar. Um, people don't really know about them. A lot of people haven't heard about them. They're off, off the uh, beaten track, if you like, of other investors. But there are little gems to be found out there. And a lot of the companies we've owned, we've owned them for a long time. We know management well. Um, you know, the turnover in, in, in the fund is only 15%. A lot of the names we've had for seven, eight years or the entire length of uh, the microcap funds uh, existence, um, you know, and we're just, as I mentioned before, we're avoiding, you know, hot stocks, speculative stocks, um, concept stocks, you know, bi biotechs where there's a binary outcome on, you know, on test results, things like that where capital can be destroyed. We really are 
focus on that preservation of capital. Understood, and that and there's the performance numbers um, since inception, and obviously that comes through with the upside and downside capture ratios, and that's why the fund's been less volatile than the index. Um, it's managed to keep up when markets are performing well, but when markets get knocked around, um, the down capture ratio is only 46%. So what that simply means to our audience is as markets are falling, this fund only captures 46% of the downside on average, and that's why it's less volatile than the benchmark. Um, so to you, Alex, um, many of our clients require um, income to support their needs either in retirement or as they approach retirement. Um, I don't think people would generally think about microcap investing as the space for income, but could you perhaps talk about how the fund can provide income and maybe reference a couple of stocks in the portfolio, Alex? Yeah, so, you know, solid and, and growing dividends is, is something that we certainly look for um, as investors. And we appreciate that, you know, clients, uh, your clients value that as well. You can see the dividend yield on the portfolio is, is 6.3%. Um, and that compares to the, the benchmark yield of, of just 4.9%. And I think, as you pointed out, that is quite unusual for a micro cap fund. Um, we're also aware of, of the value of franking credits uh, in the hands of, of unit holders. And so, you know, we're pleased that the, the, the average, you know, franking uh, of those dividends in the portfolio is, is above the, the benchmark level as well. So as part of the process, we regularly meet with, with management companies um, of the businesses we're invested in. Uh, we've often developed, you know, really good relationships with those management teams over a period of, of a number of years. And we see that a key part of, of the discussions with those management teams is talking about capital allocation. So that means making sure that the companies have enough capital to fund their operations and their growth, but not too much capital. And where we think that companies are holding too much cash on the balance sheet um, or are sitting on excess franking credits, then, then we are you know, very direct in, in communicating um, with them and trying to get them to um, return some of that capital to shareholders. And that can take the form of uh, higher regular dividends or special dividends or off-market buybacks, things like that. So one stock that um, we wanted to touch on that, that we think you know, certainly has um, fit the bill in terms of paying a, a nice and, and growing dividend over time is Pacific Current Group. Uh, so that stock's been in the fund for now around six years. It's uh, essentially an investment vehicle that owns stakes in about 15 different boutique fund managers, uh, and that's across a range of, of asset classes. Um, so you can see the various boutiques that they own stakes in uh, on the slide there. You know, for example, Victory Park is a credit manager. Uh, Proterra is a natural resources investment firm, and GQG is quite a well-known global equities manager uh, that's based in the US. So PAC's got minority stakes in those boutiques and they earn, um, they earn either a share of their revenues or a share of their profits on a regular basis. Uh, and we think that PAC provides exposure to, to a really nicely diversified portfolio of managers. So a lot of the underlying funds are closed ended. Uh, they're largely denominated in US dollars, which means that Farm and earnings tend to be actually quite stable, um, even through periods of, of higher volatility. So we saw that through COVID, um, through that period, PAX aggregate farm was actually um, actually increased, and that was helped by a, by a weaker Aussie dollar as well. Uh, so PAC was a really really good performer for the fund last year. It was up about twenty percent versus the the broader benchmark, which declined by twenty percent. And, and the key driver, I think, was um, the listing of one of their boutiques, GQG, on the ASX in, in October last year. So PAC initially invested $5 million in GQG back when it was, uh, when it was started in 2016 uh, for a 5% stake in the business. And GQG has since grown its farm to over $90 billion uh, US in in the last five years through very strong investment performance, but also clearly um, some, some very good distribution capability. And PAC, uh, so GQG listed at, at a $6 billion valuation uh, in October last year. So PAC essentially turned 
a $5 million investment into a stake that was worth 300 million in the space of five years. Um, also, you know, the business still has a, a very strong net cash balance sheet. Um, and we think the, the valuation is still very attractive around 12 times earnings and, and that dividend yield is, is close to, uh, close to 6%. Does it make you feel dirty owning another fund manager, Alex, working at Perpetual? Uh, no, no, it doesn't. I mean, you know, these businesses can be, um, can be great businesses when things are humming and performance is good and, and funds are coming in the door. Um, so no, no, we're, we're fine with it as long as we think it's, uh, it stacks up for the unit holders. Good to hear. Just as long as you don't go and work for them. Now, just um, <laughs> picking up on the, on the yield in the fund, I can only imagine in this micro cap space, there's probably a lot of yield traps, Alex. Um, investments that seem to have a very, very high yield, but probably isn't sustainable. And I think lots of people, when they invest directly into micro caps, can get sucked into those sort of stocks. How, mm. how do you avoid those yield traps in the index? Well, I think, you know, re regardless of, you know, often regardless of how cheap something looks on a, on a headline multiple or on a dividend yield, it, it's going to be very difficult to make money. Um, if the business isn't growing its earnings over time. So mm. we spend a lot of time doing work on, on industries and, and various, you know, structural trends to make sure that we're not investing in, in businesses that are facing lots of headwinds and, and that are really going to struggle to grow earnings over a long period of time. So it really comes down to a lot of research. Um, you know, valuation is, is very important to our process, but, you know, it's not just valuation alone. If, if a stock's cheap, it, that can't be the, the sole thesis for it. Um, there has to be a solid underlying business or some sort of asset play or something underneath that. Yeah, reverting back to that perpetual process. And this looks like a perpetual portfolio, lower PE ratio than the index, better dividend yields, and a lower price to book ratio as well. Now, I know um, you stock because hate getting pinned on the macro stuff, but I, are, I am going to ask a, a macro question. We should have the Ron Burgundy picture here, him drinking the beer on the couch. But anyway, but it did escalate quickly. Um, we're experiencing something at the moment that we haven't experienced for a very, very long time, um, even decades, some might say, uh, Alex, and that's inflation and rising, impact, rising interest rates. I guess the question is, um, how does this affect the portfolio and the underlying businesses within the portfolio? Yeah, if we take a step back, just just thinking about inflation, it's it's running at the highest level at the moment um, in in over thirty years, and the RBA is you know telling telling the market that it thinks that inflation is going to get to seven percent by the end of this year, and that's very different to what we've seen over the last ten years leading into COVID, where inflation's averaged just just two percent. So that step up has been driven by both demand and supply. So on the demand side, as we've come out of COVID, um, there's obviously been strong demand. The government's you know, provided a lot of stimulus to businesses and to consumers as well. And then on the supply side, you know, the tragic events um, that have been unfolding over in Europe, in, in Ukraine, have contributed to shortages in some key commodities. We've also had more recently lockdowns in China. And then, of course, closer to home, um, the floods and, and other natural disasters that we've seen in Australia have contributed to, to those shortages on the supply side. So central banks are, are very aware of how dangerous high inflation can be to economies, especially when it becomes entrenched. So they've been forced to move quite aggressively, um, lifting interest rates to try and get inflation back under control. And if we look at the debt markets, you know, they're forecasting for the RBA cash rate to be above 3% by the end of this year. And that is from 1.35% uh, currently. And, and that cash rate was only 50, 15 basis points um, just a few months ago. So a very sharp and, and, uh, and significant move in interest rates. And we think about interest rates uh, acting almost as gravity on, on financial assets and, and rising interest rates typically, typically aren't, aren't positive. We've seen that so far this year with the small lords down 25% over the first half of this calendar year. Um, but we think, you know, on a relative basis, our fund is, is very well positioned for, for rising interest rates. So firstly, a key part of the process 
as Jack outlined, was um, a focus on buying businesses with really strong balance sheets. So six of the top 10 positions in the fund have net cash balance sheets. There's two others um, that have got significant property and financial assets sitting against pretty modest debt levels. Um, so as interest rates continue to, to increase, um, those businesses that have higher debt are going to start to see their earnings crimped by those rising interest costs. And then secondly, in a, in a rising interest rate environment, getting ac access to debt funding and access to um, funding from equity markets from investors becomes a lot more difficult. So this puts unprofitable businesses in a really tough position where they're reliant on those debt and equity markets to fund their operations and to fund growth. Again, as Jack said, you know, we only invest in profitable businesses that are generating solid cash flows. So these businesses can are able to fund their own operations and growth opportunities, um, even when the debt and equity markets are, are closed for business, so to speak. And then just lastly, um, yeah, as you can appreciate, rising interest rates have a bigger impact on higher valuation stocks relative to lower valuation stocks. Um, and that's that's with more of it's because more of their expected cash flows are further out in the future. So, you know, typically as value investors, we're invested in um, stocks that have lower valuation multiples. Um, so we think they'll they'll hold up better than the broader market. Now we're going to keep the positivity going here, Alex. Um, linking in from interest rates is recession. It's one of these words that we're just constantly hearing about um, in the press. Again, you know, we've got a very mild, in the, in the grand scheme of things, we've got a pretty mild recession during COVID, but um, there's lots of chat around a recession at, at the at a recessionary environment at the moment. Um, can you prepare the fund for a recession and for that type of environment? And what sort of stocks do you like in, in that environment? Yeah, so probably unsurprisingly, we don't spend a, a huge amount of time, you know, debating uh, debating the macro and trying to put numbers around, you know, the, the probabilities of recession. Um, you know, we look at the RBA, they've got armies of economists and lots and lots of data and they've managed to get it spectacularly wrong in the last 12 months. So, you know, what chance, we figure what chance do we have as mere models. Um, but we, we do get the opportunity to speak with management teams uh, of um, companies across lots of industries on a regular basis. And in terms of what they're telling us at the moment, the consumer is still is still really strong in spending. And you can see that in a lot of the retail updates recently. A lot of businesses are really struggling to um, find staff and fill roles. They're having to um, you know, pay up for, for those, um, to fill those roles. But they are hopeful, I guess, that you know, as immigration starts to return back to more normal levels later this year, that that's going to ease some of those pressures. And then finally, you know, most businesses out there are increasing the prices um, that they're charging for goods and services, and that seems to be sticking at the moment. So that's all kind of backward looking. And of course, markets are forward looking. They're not focused on what's happening at the moment, but really what is likely to happen in the next six to 12 months and beyond. And there's no doubt that we're coming into a more difficult uh, and more challenging economic environment. So we think the market's going to place more emphasis on tried and tested business models, businesses that are um, generating lots of cash. And we also thought, think it's even more important to, um, to be backing the best management teams in each industry at the moment as things become potentially more difficult. So one stock that we think really fits the bill there, and, and we spoke about it, um, going back on, on the webinar 12 months ago, is for about the last eight years, it's not the most glamorous business. It's the uh, leading supplier in Australia of extruded aluminium products. So if you think about um, doors and window frames and things like that, and there's also various um, industrial and commercial uses, for example, in, in, in boats and, and trucks and things like that. So they've got a really big network throughout Australia of manufacturing facilities where they take rolled aluminium and turn them into um, those value added products. And we, we're aware that, you know, obviously that capital, it is a very cyclical business. It's tied to business confidence and um, residential uh, construction levels. But what we think the market's underestimating is just the resilience of capital's earnings through the cycle. 
So the management team have been there for a long time. Um, they took some quite drastic actions going back to two years ago to restructure one of the main or the main um, manufacturing operations up in Queensland. And they took out eight or nine million dollars of of cost through that restructuring. And, and they are permanent cost savings. They will stay out, out of the business. So we think the kind of mid cycle earnings for capital is is higher, uh, is a lot higher on the back of that and, and probably uh, is underestimated by the market. So the business as well, it's got a lot of hard assets, uh, $50 million of net cash, which is about a third of the market cap. And it's trading on just five times um, last year's earnings. Uh, earnings are probably going to be um, flat or up a little bit this year and a very attractive, um, a very attractive dividend yield as well. So it ticks the boxes, not carrying any debt got some cash on the balance sheet as well, Alex. I guess the question that people may ask about a business like Capital, how is it exposed to maybe a softer residential housing market? Yeah, look, there is some exposure there. The, the bulk of um, within that residential um, piece for them, the bulk, uh, the bulk is detached housing rather than um, apartments or uh, multi-storage dwelling, which is should be a little bit more resilient. Um, yep. Also, there, there is a lot of orders um, in the pipeline and, and um, there is a lot of visibility over the next year or two in terms of demand, which is, uh, which is going to remain strong for that period of time. So, um, you know, there is some cyclicality, um, but also some good visibility over the, over the medium term and, and the cost base as well is, is, has been restructured and, and I guess right sized to withstand better withstand any kind of volatility on the demand side understood and it's is it the large still the largest position in the portfolio alex it is yeah it is uh the largest position in in the portfolio at the moment yes yep cool now linking linking on from capital i just saw at the top of the presentation there that it's been held in the fund for eight years i guess the other sort of inference people may have from a micro cap fund is maybe that the turnover maybe relatively high, you're buying things that are cheap and then selling them that are high and then cycling them back into something else. Um, the historical nature of the fund is the turnover hasn't been high. Um, can you talk us through why turnover is relatively low within the fund? I mean, I'm happy yeah. to answer that, Patrick, if you like. Um, turnover is low because these businesses we own um, have been delivering, you know, good earnings growth, but they haven't ever got expensive. We probably sell them if they got expensive, but they've been cheap, stayed cheaper. They've grown earnings. Mm. In some cases, they've grown earnings and got cheaper. Um, yeah. So, look, we're long-term investors. We're not like, you know, as traders and, and here for a short time. We like to buy something with a view to owning it for a long time. Um, and some of these companies, if they did get expensive, you know, we'd sell them, but they've just grown earnings and not really re-rated and we've been collecting the dividends and benefiting from their um, EPS growth and the good management teams. Um, so the turnover is around 15%, which, which, is, uh, which is a good thing, I think. Mm. Very good. And the one-year number, Jack, uh, I know you guys are always focused on the looking forward, but I don't think we can... I go through the presentation okay. without talking about the last 12 months. Unbelievable year. The fund is straight through with a small positive return when uh, small caps were down 20, micro caps weren't down quite as much, but nonetheless, the funds held up relatively well. Um, how have you managed to outperform the market in what's been a very, very tough environment? Yeah, I think that comes back to those quality filters and that discipline around the process that's based on capital preservation um, so it's what we didn't own there that's in the small orders that became quite a crowded space into long duration assets and unprofitable tech companies, speculative companies, just avoiding um, investments that other people and other, some of our competitors, you know, had a lot of investments in, um, really, you know, preserve that capital, our clients' capital, which is, you know, at front of mind the whole time. And I guess the next question is, Jack, is how much further can this go? Values had a really, really good run relative to growth, which is right in yeah. perpetual's hitting zone. But, you know, where, where do you think things are in the value versus growth space? 
Yeah, look, I mean, just with the uncertainty on interest rates, I think it's way too early to be rushing back into, you know, high growth, unprofitable companies. Um, you know, it was tough 10 years, I guess, with low interest rates. Uh, but I think when you own when you own a share in a company, when you're an investor, you want to own a share in a profitable company. You want to be collecting dividends. You want to sleep at night because you've got confidence in the management team, the business model, um, and knowing they're not going broke and they're going to be around for the next 10 years. So, look, we're kind of always obviously going to be, you know, very pro-value investing. That's all we know, having been at Perpetual you know, 20 years and 10 years respectively. Um, but, you know, interest rates, you know, continue to rise. I think sleeping at night and collecting dividends, you know, is, is, is way more important than trying to venture off the track uh, at this stage. Okay. Now, obviously, with the volatility in markets, there must be some things that have popped up on your screens in recent times. Yep. I know you want to talk about a couple of stocks. I College, is that Alex or Jack's? Yeah, I can talk about that. Yeah, no beautiful. Problem. Well, you'll so be talking about iCollege probably... and Jack's going to be talking about GenTrack. And I guess um, market corrections throw up opportunities, Jack. Um, why do you yep. like this stock now? Yeah, so iCollege is probably a company that's not necessarily at this stage of the cycle a pure kind of value company. Um, mm. It's, a, you know, obviously suffered. It's an education business where 80% of the students come from overseas. So I've very much suffered through COVID, uh, you know, as everyone would understand. Uh, we owned a business called Red Hill Education that merged with iCollege um, during COVID or the latter stages of COVID. Um, it was a good business, but it was quite little, Red Hill, and iCollege was similar, you know, good business, just a little bit little. So they got together um, and they did offer different training courses and programs. So they brought together a greater offering for students. Um, they've got a very strong balance sheet. It's got more than 20% of its market cap in cash, but we're at the early stages of a recovery. Now, education as an export for Australia, you know, is, is a significant one. Um, it's taken a while for the students to come back, but their early bookings are showing, you know, significant you know, revenue visibility. Um, we like the management there. We've known them because they were part of Red Hill Education. Um, and it look, looks quite cheap now, but the projected earnings growth with the forward bookings that they've already received and their ability to buy other competitors that have failed or couldn't finance um, through COVID. So a lot of their competitors have struggled or gone bankrupt. Um, so they're able to buy businesses and people um, in this environment, which we think is you know, a, great, you know, a great asset at this time. And so we think earnings should double in the next uh, 12 to 18 months. Interesting. Um, Alex, GenTrack. Now, GenTrack's a little bit different because this is a very new, well, not new, but a newer investment to the portfolio that you've added to the portfolio in the last 12 months. Can you talk us through the Gen GenTrack business, Alex, and why you like it? Yeah, Patrick. So we we bought the position um, initially in September last year. It's a it's a New Zealand based software business. So they provide customer information and billing systems um, mainly to utilities customers. Uh, a lot of them are in the UK, but also in Australia and New Zealand. So that's about eighty percent of the revenues and the earnings. And then the other twenty percent is. Um, they provide software information systems into airports around the world. So that's the other 20%. Uh, it listed, GenTrack listed on the, a, on the ASX back in 2014, had a good run initially, um, but then had a series of downgrades through 2018 and, and 19 and 20 on the back of some, some weakness in their UK utilities customers. And the, the business also did a few acquisitions, which turned out... Um, to be not quite uh, not quite what they expected um, at the time. So the share price fell uh, a very long way through 2019 and 2020. Um, a new CEO came in. His name was his name is uh, Gary Miles. He started in October of 2020, and we've had the opportunity to meet with him a couple of times since he came in. We think he's doing a really good job turning the business around. Um, reinvesting back in the products and, and simplifying the business. 
and there were some really positive time uh, positive signs at the result a few months ago. So utilities revenues um, grew by 15%, um, which was really pleasing. Again, the business has got a strong balance sheet, um, net cash to the to the tune of 20 million dollars, and we think the valuation is is extremely attractive. Uh, the stock's probably under earning at the moment, um, just given they're going through this reinvestment phase. The accounting's very conservative. They, they expense all of their R&D now um, and the stock's trading on one-time sales. Um, it was making margins of, of around 30% going back um, a number of years ago and management's got some targets out there for FY24 earnings. Um, based on those targets, the, the stock, if they can get there, the stock would be trading on five times EBITDA. Um, we think they're on the right track and if they can get close to those targets then um, we think the stocks can be trading uh, a lot higher um, at that point the cfo will get kicked out of the it cfo's club for expensing all their r d but anyway um yeah. interesting business because i think most people with micro caps alex would think generally exposed only to australia but this has got 56 percent of its revenue skewed towards the uk yeah it's an interesting uh it's an interesting story it's it's um it's a yeah, New Zealand-based business that that's managed to have a lot of success overseas and has, has got some really big, um, really big customers over in the UK. So it's a it's a great it's a great little success story out of New Zealand. Just a final question to to both of you. We're about to enter reporting season. Um, you guys will be pretty busy over the next month or two. Jack, you what what are you sort of looking out for in reporting season? Yes. Interesting. I mean, it's going to be very interesting indeed. I mean, it's really forward-looking statements. I think, as Alex said, the market you know focuses on not what's looking back, but what's looking forward. And there's a lot of uncertainty, like where how much more interest rates, um, you know, rises are going to come. I mean, no one seems to quite know the answer to that. There won't be a lot of guidance. Um, I think management teams will be cautious. Um, so, look, it, it, we one of the most interesting reporting seasons for years, given that companies, you know, a lot of companies are going very well right now, albeit there's quite a lot of cost inflation, wage inflation, but um, the outlook, I guess, um, is going to be murky. So it's more about mitigating risk from our point of view, um, sticking to management teams we, we know and like and business models we understand and conservative balance sheets. But um, I think like all of us, um, the future's a little bit uncertain, but uh, from this uncertainty, you know, it might throw up some, um, companies we really like that we think are a bit expensive might uh, might come into our valuation sort of region. So in that respect, um, especially as companies get smaller and come into that 300 million free float um, valuation that we need it to be to be into micro cap, we might be able to buy companies that we've uh, always been on our wish list. Great. Thank you, guys. Really appreciate you joining us today and presenting to our clients. Wishing you both all the best and um, all the best for reporting season. Stay well. Thanks, thanks very Patrick. much and thanks Patrick and thanks to all the clients out there.